happening. So just those that are, are able to give towards our chair campaign, you can just EFT and just put their chairs. And I'm really grateful we've done it only for a week and already a number of people have contributed towards that. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Now I can release the babies. They've already gone. Um, they're going to go and have a time together. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can again sit under your word and dive into your word. And Holy Spirit, we do invite you in this moment to help us get to grips with what your word says, God. That you, Holy Spirit, can illuminate the word and really just help us to apply it to our lives. Would you help us change the way we think and feel and behave? So welcome, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we've been doing a sermon series called New Creation, Living Our True Identity, and this is part three. So we do like teaching through a sermon series because we're able to build on these foundations, not just do single messages every week. So if you have missed the last um, two sermons, please head over to our YouTube channel. You'll find those sermons there. But today I've titled it Christ in me. So let me just give a small recap for those that are, have arrived today and, and don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about identity. And I'm going to use these plastic containers to help illustrate some of these spiritual truths. I think it was Louis Giglio many years ago that spoke about the gospel of Tupperwares. I know this isn't a Tupperware, but it is a plastic container. I got into trouble the last time I once mentioned that, that this was a Tupperware. I didn't really know that this wasn't a Tupperware. Tupperwares are way better quality than this thing. So let's say this is you. And we all come with, yeah, lots of different facts about us. We live in a world today that says you need to identify who you are. Look within to identify and self-identify who you are. Now we take what we do from Monday to Friday and we take what other people have said about us. We take a whole bunch of different factors to help us answer this question, who am I? So I said our identity is our self-concept. It's the story we have about who we are. It's the way that we look at ourselves. This is the person that I am. And many of us struggle to know who am I and what is my purpose and why am I alive? And unfortunately, we've taken what people have said about us, we've taken our failures, and these things have all damaged. I don't know if you can really see this, this Tupperware, for those that are maybe online, the cameras can zoom up, but this is a damaged Tupperware. It's been through some ups and downs. I know none of us here are perfect, and unfortunately, there are factors and forces that have shaped the context as to who we are. And I said last week, our identity journey begins with this thought. I am not who I think I am, but I am who God says I am. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, we lose the right to identify and define who we are. We then look to the Creator to help us, the created, understand and identify who we are. So we looked at some circles, and part of looking through Scripture is to say, God, how is it, who is it that you've called us to be? How do you see us? And then hopefully that helps us see what we believe about ourselves. And our goal is to move these circles together. So segment three is the area that where our beliefs about who I am overlap with how God sees me. And I'm hoping that as we study Scripture and as we look at Scripture, we start saying, yes, God, this is who you say I am, not who the world tells me I am. And there are many forces that are trying to shape us in our identity. Uh, we looked at the kingdom identity. We look at our color of our skin, our culture, our upbringing, who we are. We look at nature versus nurture. We look at socialization. We look at maybe our backgrounds. And the big question is, who is it that identifies us? Who is it that wins at the end of the day when we try and answer this question, who am I? And last week we painted this picture and it wasn't a very pretty picture. 
But we looked at this struggle that we have with sin. And the New Testament writers speak of sin as not just an action, but also as a condition of being in sin. So last week we, we got to the realization that we don't just sin, but the sin nature is within us. So we looked at this concept of being in Adam, and it's a bit of a hopeless situation. So there is the circle, the phrase, in Adam, because we are in Adam, we are sinners. And we use this term, like, for example, if you are a plumber, or a carpenter, or a teacher, or a sinner, we often use those phrases to define who we are. So yes, in Adam, we are sinners that have this sinful nature, and we sin. So let me then acknowledge that sin is within us, and we sin. And apart from God, and apart from His grace, this is quite a sad situation. And then we have the good news. In Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, it says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. So by His grace, through faith, we experience a real change. And today I want to try and emphasize and talk about the change that we experience. And, and the Apostle Paul says, you can't take credit for this. This is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done, so none of us can boast about it. If we are, as a church, doing what a church is supposed to be, not just being this nice holy huddle of Christians, there will be people here today or watching online, this is a picture of your spiritual state. That in Adam, sin presides in you and you sin. And no good work, nothing you try and do, will be enough for you when you stand before God one day. This is a hopeless situation. You come, maybe even coming to church, you think is a religious duty or an act. Maybe you put some money in the offering, or maybe you buy a whole bunch of chairs for us. It is not going to be good enough at the end of the day. It is by God's grace through faith that we experience salvation, that we experience what it means to be in Christ. So all who are born again, this is a term that we use being born again in Christ or of Christ, have an identity change. We then become saints or we become new creations. And we started off with that verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The new has come and the old is gone. So we, we looked at these two, two natures, the in Adam and in Christ, and we used the term the second Adam or the last Adam when we, we look at what it means to be in Jesus. But I want to just again go back to this state, and Paul in Romans chapter 5 really talks about it. So let's look at how many times he uses the term death in this state that we find ourselves in. Romans 5 verse 12 to 20 says this, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from that time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey the explicit commandment of God, as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come, but there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule 
over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. I don't have time to get into this particular passage, but there are a whole bunch of theological terms that we could look at. We could look at this term, justification. Justification is that judgment that a judge would make over someone declaring them free or not guilty, accrediting that person with justification or righteousness. And God, when you give your life to Jesus, there is a change that happens and he looks at you justified, just as if you had never sinned. Then there's another phrase I could look at, righteousness. A good definition of this word righteousness means right in being. It means that you are what you are supposed to be, not what you are not supposed to be. And I, I read the verse in Romans 5 verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, but by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous, to be in right relationship and right standing with God. And many times in church, we focus on those top section of theological words, but seldomly do we spend some time looking at this word regeneration and union with Christ. And next week, I'll probably move over into transformation, this ongoing transformation that God does. But let's look at this word, regeneration. This is a term that we use to explain what happens at conversion, what happens when we get born again. And I would like to try and illustrate this by using some of these plastic containers to explain what regeneration is. So five points this morning. When we are born again, we are moved from one kingdom to another kingdom. The Bible says we are moved from the kingdom of darkness and we are moved into the kingdom of light. Number two, we become a new species of humanity. We are taken out of humanity in Adam and we are placed into humanity in Christ. This is what I'm going to get to this morning. And then thirdly, we have a mystical relationship with Christ. He lives in us and we live in him. Whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Mystery. A, anything mystical or top secret. I know that there are people that love when there's something mystical or this is a secret. And everyone gets all excited when I get sent videos of the, uh, someone's discovered some secret in the Bible, some secret thing that no one knows about. Let me tell you this mystery that Paul talks about in Colossians verse 1 to 25. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this, are you ready? This is the secret. Does anyone know the answer? This is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Or this is the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. For those of you that write in your Bible, if you were to take Paul's New Testament letters and every time you circle the in Christ or what it means to be Christ in your Christ or being in Christ, it happens many times all over the New Testament. And the example, one of the examples is found in Galatians 2 verse 20, 
that says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So let's go back to these plastic containers and let's talk about regeneration. What happens at conversion? There is this change in your nature from being just in Adam to being in Christ. So I'm going to leave sin over here for a moment and I'm going to talk about this great mystery that happens. Christ seals you with his spirit. The spirit of Christ comes and makes his home in you. And the Bible says, this is the mystery. Christ lives in you. So now I have myself with my personality and still my brokenness and my issues and all that I've experienced in life, but I have another person living inside of me. And the weird thing is that it's a bit of a strange thing to get to terms with what it means to have God living inside of you. It is no longer I who live, but Paul says Christ lives in me. Not I, but Christ. But how, we all try and understand. Again, I said at the beginning of the sermon series, this can be quite an abstract teaching series. This whole thing of new creations and the new has come and Christ in you. And it really has to do with this position in God versus this experience and this reality that we don't always quite understand. But let's think about it for a moment. God's spirit dwells in you, Rickus. He has come and made his home in you. God, Stephen Jabeer sitting at the back there, is living in you. Jess, the birthday girl. God is living inside of you. No longer do I need to just see myself as being in Adam and being a sinner, but something changes. And when God looks at me, he sees Christ in me. But I don't always feel it, right? JC, my friend at the back there, God is living inside of you. When you woke up this morning, you need to start changing the way you think when you get out of bed to think Christ lives in me. It is no longer JC that lives, but Christ lives in you. So what does it mean for God to live, live in us? It means that you are not the only one inside of you. Many of us carry this assumption that our humanity is opposed to God's divinity. That humanity and divinity are like oil and water. They just don't mix. But last week I spoke about the original plan that God had in Genesis to be made in the image of God, in his likeness. So our humanity is a vehicle of expressing God's divinity. It is not something God tries to work around. It is something he wants to work through our humanity. Look at Jesus. Jesus was fully man. The son of God, the son of man. The Bible says that in Colossians 2 verse 9, for in Jesus, the fullness of deity dwells in body. So it is, it is possible to have this concept of God living in broken human beings, in living in you and I. And this is where we need to trust for revelation of this. And I try to picture what it's like for someone to come to church for the very first time as an unbeliever and walk in, and I'm telling these people in this building that God lives in you. And I'm sure it must be a, a strange concept. God, through his spirit, living inside of us. And it gets better. Because as I said, when God looks at me, he sees me just as if I had never sinned. He sees me in right standing. 
So I need to understand that for me to recognize that he has cleansed me, he has made me holy and pure, that I am a fit vessel for God to dwell in me. Jesus, you come and make, by your spirit, you come and make your home in me. And I sometimes wonder about God feeling at home in me. You know, when you go to someone else's house, it's a bit of a strange place to stay in someone else's room and sleep in someone else's bed. And you open the drawers and they still have their clothes there and you kind of put your clothes. You know, you don't feel at home. How, how at home do you think Christ feels living inside of you? I want him to have access to all the rooms in my life, all the areas of my life. Christ lives in me. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But now this is where it gets this is where I need more clarity in my understanding, God. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, My old self, we're not just talking about our old bodies, but he says our old self has been crucified with Christ. So point number four is through our union with Christ, we are baptized into his death and resurrection. So not only does Christ live in me, but I am also in Christ. I am joined with Christ, or I am joined to Christ. And let me try to use some terminology to also explain this. So when I say you have been baptized into Christ, let me go to a verse. Romans 6 verse 1 to 5 says this, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall continually be united with him in a resurrection like this. Okay, everyone, everyone concentrating. Because we've got to understand this concept of being joined with Christ, baptized. Do you know what the word baptism means? Immersed fully immersed, so if I take this white shirt and I baptize it in a bath full of dye, I don't just sprinkle it, I fully immerse it under the water, and that Greek word talks about being baptismo, coming out changed, baptized, immersed. Like, who likes gherkins? I don't. Take a gherkin and you put it, put it in like pickled juice, vinegar. You pickle it and it changes. It comes out different, right? It's got a tang to it. It gets baptized in vinegar. <laughs> so it gets better, Joni Lynn says. So the Bible says you get joined into Christ when his spirit comes and lives inside of you. You get baptized into his death, into his burial, and into his resurrection. So when we finish the service this morning, we're going to sing a song that we sing in East, during the Easter time called Glorious Day. Oh, what a glorious day. Uh, <laughs> And then it goes, because you have saved me. And then it talks about, I, don't laugh at me. That's why I'm not singing on stage. But, but the song goes, and I walked out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. And I always wondered singing, and I walked out of that grave. I wasn't there. I didn't walk out of grave. But when I am united into Christ, when he was on the cross, I was baptized in him 
Then he dies and he walks out of that grave. And because he did that, because his spirit lives in me and I am joined in him, I walked out of that grave, out of the darkness. So this is where this union with Christ, this this standing with Christ becomes a reality. And this is why we have to understand this because we need to stop seeing ourselves in our nature in Adam that says, my identity is a sinner. Paul says in this passage, count yourself dead to sin. See it that sin has been defeated, dealt with. It is no longer your master. Christ is your new master. You are no longer slaves to this. You are slaves to righteousness. Why? Because Christ lives in me. And I have been joined, baptized into his death. And he died, died. He didn't half die. So I am not half dead to sin, I am dead to sin. And his new nature, this in Christ, now lives in me. This is my new reality. So through our union with Christ, we are baptized into his death and resurrection. Our old self dies and we rise into a new self. And probably next week we'll get into this. But this new nature, God breathed into us by the resurrection through regeneration, is righteous from day one. But we need to talk about how it grows in us through this ongoing renewal. Now, it gets even better. And this is what I was trying, I was getting excited about last week. Colossians 3, verse 3 says, For you die to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So now let's look at our standing. This is why when we read that verse, it says, Nothing can separate you from the love of God, neither death nor angels, nor demons, all the things can separate you from the love of God. Because where are you positionally in God? Christ is in you. You are in Christ. And it says your real life is hidden with Christ in God. There you are, somewhere inside of there. But we need a revelation that says this is not the thing that defines me. My old self has been crucified with Christ. And look at this. Is it a paradox? It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live. I don't live, but I live. Christ lives in me and through me. So Lord, would you help us change our thinking that all who are born of Adam, unfortunately, are in a bit of a hopeless situation. But all of us who have been born again, born into Christ, now have this identity, You are a saint. You are a new creation. And we find this hard because we still sin, right? But see it this way, that I am a saint that can still sin. I am not a a sinner that sins. See, we come to church to find God as a born-again believer, but actually God lives inside of me. And I need to see myself as a new creation. And on this process of regeneration, sorry, I'll show you on the next slide. The clicker stopped working. To truly discover who I am, I must first find my identity in Christ where my true self is revealed. Here's the illustration that I'm talking of. There is on the left my old self in Adam when I give my heart to Jesus and his spirit comes and seals me in God, I get adopted into his family, I get joined. Look at Jesus, there's the cross, his resurrection, and that's the early church being filled with his spirit. Through this baptism, 
I want to just say this quickly, now that I'm thinking about it. When we get water baptized on stage behind those curtains, is it that act that gets you saved? That act is a symbol of what happens when you join to Christ. You get immersed, you get put full immersion underwater. You get joined into Jesus through his death, resurrection, and you come out a new creation. If people got saved just through water baptism, like we would force people to get water baptized, right? <laughs> Come for a pool party. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> now you get to heaven. It is symbolism of, of this being born again. This is what this word is all about that we're looking at today, this, this new identity in God. So how do we live by the indwelling Christ. This is what I want you to think of this week, and I'm going to invite the worship team up onto stage. How do I journey in discovering my new identity in Christ? Paul no longer lives, but Christ lives in me. I now, I now live the Christ life. Christ is my new identity. And this is where we need to shift from going, you must self-identify. I want to say this as a follower of Jesus, you lose that right now. God is the one that identifies you, and we need to find our identity in Him. Christ is my new identity, and we are on a journey of becoming more Christ-like. This is the outworking of your salvation to change the way you think, to change your behaviors, not to be a slave to sin anymore, to be more Christ-like in your words and your habits and your thought life and your attitudes. This is the outworking of the life of Christ in you. Christ, my life. Christ lives through me. This was my desire for each one of you this year to live on mission for the king. And do you know how we get to do it? We first discover that I have been created to live in Christ, by Christ, and for Christ. Amen. See, living on mission for the king is a daunting thing when you think God is separate and you are separate. When you understand that he lives inside of you, that when you walk into the office on Monday morning, Christ is living inside of you. Those are good effects, eh? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Christ in me. And then you get to do what he calls you to do. Doing this thing as being a pastor, I have to do things that I am not comfortable doing. I am not made to do. But I have to say, Christ in me, help me do it. Be it. No longer will you be identified by the month of the year that you are born in. Don't read part of a magazine that says this is who you are because you are born in August. I'm sorry. Who you are is in Christ. Amen. And it's allowing Christ to come out through your personality, through your gifts, through your talents, all the spiritual gifts that God has given you to come alive, to live on, on mission for the King, to live with a purpose, to get you out of bed in the morning saying, this is why I'm alive. Help me to see my identity in you, Jesus. Would you change the way I think? Would you... Give us revelation, God. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has begun. Thank you, Jesus.
Now I'm going to hand over to those that can sing. <laughs> and can remember the lyrics to the songs. So put your Bibles away, notepads away. And let's sing a song that we sing on Resurrection Sunday. I have the resurrected Christ living inside of me. That if I were to physically die today when Jesus comes back, the resurrection life is living inside of me. And I will be resurrected because of Christ that lives in me. So when it gets to that part of the song that says, I walked out of that grave, I want to say to that person here today, struggling with sin, struggling with addiction, struggling with something to do with our sinful nature, see yourself dead to sin because Jesus walked out of that grave. He defeated sin and He defeated death and you get to be resurrection life, new creations in Christ this morning. Won't you stand? <laughs> Let's sing the song with passion like we are excited. Mm -hmm. 